Uh, now, in uh, March of 1959, uh, you left Memphis for L.A. Now, as I, I recall from your book, by the way, can you recall some, some memories out of that book that maybe you'd like to share? I remember in 1959 when I felt like I'd gone just about as far as I could go in Memphis in terms of my career. I went to my mentor, Bill Grumbles, sat down at his desk, and I was very nervous about this because he had hired me and had loved my work and was almost like a second father to me. And I said, Mr. Grumbles, I just feel like I'd like to spread my wings and, and, and move on to a larger market. Would you help me? And he couldn't have been nicer. He said, absolutely. RKO owned WHBQ, and they also owned uh, KHJ in Los Angeles. And they owned WOR in New York, among other stations. He said, you want to go to New York or L.A.? I said, well, New York kind of scares me. But I said, L.A., palm trees, sounds good. <laughs> so he picked up the phone, and he called Norm Boggs, who ran KHJ-TV, and he said, I got this young man in my office. He's been working with us for a long time, seven years, and he's done a good job for us, and he'd love to come to L.A., Fade the Black come up on, I was hired, and in March of 1959, I came out to L.A. But I remember when Bill Grumbles hung up the telephone, he had referred to Malibu in his conversation with Norm Boggs. And this redneck said, Mr. Grumbles, just one question. What is Malibu? I had no idea there was a Malibu, California, because I had never been out of Jackson <laughs> except to go to Memphis and maybe St. Louis. But um, got on the plane, flew out with Mark Forrester, my program director, in March of 59. And I'll never forget flying into L.A. And all of you know this. If you've flown into L.A. at night, you see miles and miles and miles of lights. And I looked down and I thought, oh, my God. I turned to Mark and I said, what if I don't make it? And I have to go back with my tail between my legs. You know, I'll never get over that. And he said something that I'll never forget. He said, you just be yourself. Do what you have been doing in Memphis and Jackson before that, and people will love you. He said, L.A. is just a megalopolis of different kinds of people from all over. And he was right. And so we landed, went to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel where I stayed for the first two weeks. And after that first two weeks, I went to KHJ Radio and did mornings. And that's the way I got started out here. And... Uh, then by that summer, I was doing the same kind of television show that I'd been doing in Memphis, uh, Wink Martindale Dance Party. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, you know, no sooner that you arrived in L.A., we've got to cover this, too, uh, something happened that would follow you for your career and for the rest of your life. You made a record for Randy Wood on Dot Records, and it was called Deck of Cards. I had a contract with Randy Wood at Dot from my days in Memphis, and he said, uh, we won't be in a hurry. He was my guest on a dance party show back in Memphis. And uh, he said, uh, when you come to L.A., uh, we'll find something for you to record. But we won't be in a hurry to do it. One morning, I got off the air at KHJ, and I had a call from uh, Randy Wood's secretary. And she said, Randy wants you to come up to the office. He wants to play something for you. And uh, we were just down the street from Wallach's Music City. And Dot Records was above that. So I only had to walk about um, two city blocks. And I go up to Randy's office and walk into this plush office carpet like this. And he puts on a 78 RPM record, a scratchy record by a singer named T. Texas Tyler. It was called Deck of Cards. And he said, I want you to listen to this, and I want you to tell me, I want you to tell me what you think of it. And uh, even before he played it, I thought, well, it's a talking record. The number one record in the country is Mac the Knife by Bobby Darin. There's Venus by Frankie Avalon. Kids by Records. Who's going to buy a semi-religious talking record? But I was determined when he took the needle off that scratchy R 78 RPM record, I was going to say, Randy, I love it. <laughs> so sure enough, I mean, I wasn't about to, you know, Randy had a pretty good ear for what was making it in those days. I mean, he had found Pat Boone and Billy Vaughn and the Hilltoppers, and he had been extremely successful. Number one independent record label, bar none, in the country. 
And so uh, I knew he knew what he was doing. So when he took the needle off, he said, what do you think? I said, Randy, I love it. Well, we went into a studio about three weeks later. Billy Vaughn did the arrangement with some background singers. And uh, we recorded this thing called Deck of Cards. And it came out, and it just laid there. And about the middle of September, one morning, Bob Clayton, the number one morning man in Boston, for whatever reason, happened to put it on the turntable and play it. And the switchboard lit up. Reminded me of that night in Memphis at WHBQ, and that's all right, Mama was playing. The switchboard lit up, and he couldn't play it enough. He played it over and over again. And it swept across the country like wildfire. And by November of that year, uh, it was number four on Billboard and Cashbox. And uh, another out-of-body experience was when we received a call in November from the Ed Sullivan Show for me to come back to New York and do it. And like I said before, I, uh, I uh, never throw anything away. And I have the introduction. Now, here's a very attractive young fellow from Memphis, Tennessee. His name is Wink Martindale, and he has one of the top records of the season. I'm sure you've heard it on radio. So let's have a very nice hand for Wink Martindale, won't you? I was often told that if he really likes you and what you do on his show, he'll call you over to say hello. And he called me over. Wow. And he said, I know your family and all your friends in Memphis are very proud of you. And I got to shake his hand. Not everybody got to do that. And I know you've all heard this recording, but I thought you might want to hear it one more time. The year is 1959. Ike's president, Nixon's vice president. The Nash Rambler is introduced. Alaska and Hawaii become our 49th and 50th states. And the Barbie doll debuts. It's the year I record a narrative about this battle-weary GI playing with a deck of cards during a church service. I've always loved the power of the spoken word, so these words caught my imagination thanks to Randy Wood. I'd like to share it with you one more time. During the North African campaign, a group of soldier boys had been on a long hike, and they arrived in a little town in Italy called Casino. The next morning being Sunday, several of the boys went to church. A sergeant commanded the boys in church, and after the chaplain had read the prayer, the text was taken up next. Those of the boys who had a prayer book took them out, but this one soldier had only a deck of cards, and so he spread them out. The sergeant saw the cards and said, soldier, put away those cards. After the service was over, the soldier was taken prisoner and brought before the provo marshal. The marshal said, Sergeant, why have you brought this man here? Well, for playing cards in church, sir. And what do you have to say for yourself, son? Much, sir, replied the soldier. To which the marshal said, I hope so, for if not, I shall punish you greatly. The soldier said, Sir, I have been on the march for about six days. I had neither Bible nor prayer book, but I hope to satisfy you, sir, with the purity of my intentions. And he started this story. You see, sir, when I look at the ace, it reminds me there is but one God. And the deuce reminds me the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old and the New Testaments. When I see the tray, I think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when I see the four, I think of the four evangelists who preached the gospel. It was Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. When I see the five, it reminds me of the five wise virgins who trimmed their lamps. There were ten of them. Five were wise and were saved. Five were foolish and were shut out. When I see the six, it reminds me that in six days, God made this great heaven and earth. When I see the seven, it reminds me that on the seventh day, God rested from his great work. And when I see the eight, 
I think of the eight righteous persons God saved when he destroyed this earth. It was Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. When I see the nine, I think of the lepers our Savior cleansed, and nine of the ten didn't even thank him. When I see the ten, I think of the ten commandments God handed down to Moses on a tablet of stone. When I see the king, it reminds me there is but one king of heaven, God Almighty. And when I see the queen, I think of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is queen of heaven. And the Jack or Nave is the devil. When I count the spots on a deck of cards, I find 365, the number of days in a year. There are 52 cards, the number of weeks in a year. Four suits, the number of weeks in a month. There are 12 picture cards, the number of months in a year. There are 13 tricks, the number of weeks and a quarter. So you see, sir, my pack of cards serves me as a Bible, an almanac, and a prayer book. The story is true, I know, for I was that soldier. I mean, I've always played that. We've all heard it uh, on, on record. But to hear you perform it live was just marvelous. Uh, I, well, thank you. It really, really was touching. You know, that record has followed me my entire career. I have people to this day say, are you the same Wink Martindale who oh, yeah. recorded that deck of cards? Yeah. And my answer is always the same. Do you think there are two people walking this earth with a silly name like Wink Martindale? <laughs> In 61, after KRLA, I, had, I thought, I was wrong, but I thought that I'd had enough of rock and roll. And uh, Randy Wood always wanted me to go to work for him uh, and learn the A&R business. And uh, so he, I decided this was the time. And I uh, left KRLA and I went to, uh, to uh, work for, for Randy Wood at Dot Records as an assistant in A&R to learn that business and, the na and also be national promotion director. So I traveled around the country doing that. And while I was at Dot Records, one day, it was also my job to pick up. The, at that time, it seemed like everybody and his brother was making hit records in their garage. Remember those days oh, in 62 yeah. and 63? And, you know, uh, like, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Ka Kathy and the Originals or somebody like uh, Rosie Bay. Rosie and the Originals. Yeah. Rosie and the Originals. Yeah, yeah. But it was my job, if any masters came through the front door, pick them up for Dot. One day, in walks a guy with a local record that was getting some airplay, a little bit of airplay, on KFWB. It was called Tell It to the Birds, and it was by a singer named Dory Alpert, D-O-R-E, uh -huh. Dory Alpert. I know him well. And he played it for me, and uh, I knew it was getting airplay on KFWB, and I said, well, somebody must like it, because it's hard to get a record on KFWB, and in those days... Channel 98, Color Radio, was number one. This was before Boss Radio, KHJ. Yeah. And so I thought, hmm, I better take this in and play it for Randy. I did. He said, buy it. I said, how much shall I give him? He said, $750. I said, okay. So I went out and I told Dory. I said, uh, we'll pick it up, put it out on DOT nationally, and we'll pay you an advance fee of $750, which pleased him. Dory Alpert. Turned out to be Herbie Alpert. Herbie Alpert later formed A&M Records with Jerry Moss. Yep. I saw Jerry recently uh, at a uh, memorial service for Russ Regan. And, and, and we remembered this story. Yeah. And we both laughed about it. But uh, they took that $750 and put it together with $1,000 that they had saved up. And they recorded a thing called The Lonely Bull. And that was the beginning of Herbie Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. And we remember, all of us remember how huge, there's nothing bigger than, than, than the Tijuana Brass in those days. But that, uh, you know, again, that was one of those uh, uh, life-changing experiences almost that I was involved with, kind of like the Elvis Presley experience years, years before. Thanks for joining us. You know, I can already feel the excitement building for our next Hollywood Media Professional Celebrity Showcase.